Hello and welcome to the World Wanderers podcast. I'm Amanda. I'm Ryan. And we're your hosts. And today we're talking about staying fit, healthy. On the road. While traveling. Yes, while traveling. Um, This is sort of an interesting concept because it's come up quite a bit for us kind of before our travels, after our travels, along our travels. Um, Definitely something that we haven't quite perfected, but we wanted to share with uh, you exactly, you know, our sort of tips and tricks and some suggestions we recommend to you. Yeah. So just to start with, I guess, my personal experience, um, I've always kind of been a bit of an extremist when it came to eating and exercising and not the extremist in a way like always really on top of it, but just one extreme or the other. I'll get into these phases where I'm exercising five times a week and eating a perfect diet and then it slowly falls apart and then like two months later I'm never exercising and eating all kinds of crap. And so the first time we went traveling, I was coming out of this really healthy phase Exercise. Probably your healthiest phase. Yeah, at the healthiest point I'd been probably in my life at like 21 before we went traveling for the first time, exercising constantly, um, eating super healthy. We go traveling um, and I slowly start like I remember we were in our first like, like in Iceland and I eat a hot dog and kind of feel bad about it. And you're at a hostel, so there's not a ton of easy ways to exercise that, that I knew of at the time. And then you know, it slowly trickles down to two months later. I haven't really done any exercise. I'm eating kebabs like they're apples. Um, <laughs> like pop, Fanta. Yeah. And then like even later on in that trip, we were in Australia. So this was probably like five months into our trip or something. And we went to a gym, which was the first time we'd exercised in ages. And I remember trying to like do jumps onto a, like, I don't know, maybe like a three foot high thing and just feeling like so weak. And just kind of like disappointed with myself for not maintaining where I was at. In terms of your level of fitness and health. Yeah, in terms of my level of fitness. And then it was weird because for me, I actually lost quite a bit of weight while we were traveling. Which isn't something a lot of people... I guess like a lot of women worry about gaining weight while traveling. I Is think a lot experience? of... Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of men um, lose muscle mass. Like that's the weight you're losing, right? Is you're becoming thinner because you're losing the muscle mass that you had from exercising all the time. And um, like we weren't drinking a ton, but I think maybe for a guy, like that's the main source of gaining weight if you're consuming a lot of alcohol. Yeah. And I think, you know, it was never one of those considerations where I was like, I'm not going to travel because I'm worried about gaining weight. But it was definitely something I talked to my friends about and kind of lightly expressed concern. And I was like, oh, you know... Like coming out of university, I was like, it can't be much worse on the road than how I treated my body in university. I was drinking a lot, eating quite a bit of junk food. Um, I was pretty strict though. Like I made sure that I was at the gym or doing yoga or some sort of fitness activity at least five times a week. Um, when I wasn't partying with my friends, I was eating salads, eating, you know, like lean meats, gluten free very minimal dairy. And the reality behind traveling is that your routine gets shattered. It's really hard to keep a routine when you're moving around constantly. Well, I don't think it's, it's hard. Yeah. Hard to keep a specifically a food exercise routine. Yeah. Like the one you have at home. It's hard. You don't have as much control over what you can eat. And yeah. You don't have exercise. a gym pass. Like you can't go to the gym every day and I mean, the simple truth behind that is when you show up in a city that's amazing, like Paris or Rome, do you really want to spend an hour to two hours of your day inside a gym? I mean, not really, like not for me at least. And like, let's just jump into the the gym thing because I think a lot of people, even at like home, that's like the whole fitness industry where you go by a gym pass and you go to the gym for like an hour, um, five times a week or something and you spend like five hours in the gym every week to accomplish like most people who are going to the gym are trying to get fit and healthy and you can accomplish those things without spending that money and without spending that time and having a lot more fun in other ways. Yeah, definitely you can. Uh, I think it's very much the way our culture is in 
Canada, North America, uh, there's a huge fitness trend happening, I'd say in the last three to five years, very much into healthy foods. There's been all sorts of trends with raw food, gluten-free veganism's taken off. I'd say I didn't, I don't think I knew a single vegan five to seven years ago. I think that's probably more just your, <laughs> maybe that's just my location. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's different. fair. And I think the same with health trends, like health trends have always been. Yeah. I mean, happening. it's, it's really interesting because as a woman, I mean, it was kind of ingrained in me as an early teenager when I, my body started changing and I started developing. It's like, oh, well, you know, you're going to have to start watching what you eat. You need to start exercising regularly. Like your body can put on fat quite easily. You can't just eat poutine every day. And it really became more of a reality to me or in my mind, it became a reality that, you know, I could gain weight, that I wasn't just going to be this skinny kid that I was when I was 11, 12 years old forever. Or even, you know, 15, 16, I wasn't going to be just tiny and eat what I want. And so I definitely had some stress going into our first trip, like some, I was a bit worried, like, how am I going to continue to exercise? How am I going to make sure that I don't gain weight? And in my head, it was very much like, I'm going to gain weight. And I guess, so like our experience, we went traveling immediately after university, but there's like a common thing at least here in Canada, the States, they're called like the freshman 15 where like you gain 15 pounds in your first year of university because you transition out of this home environment where you're not really conscious of your food choices. You have a lot of food just kind of put on you by your parents. Like you're young, you can eat whatever you want. Like I'm just going to Quiznos and eating sandwiches that have like thousands of calories in them with like a brownie and like cream of broccoli and cheddar soup. Yum. <laughs> and like doing that regularly and just like fine, no problem. And then you hop into university. Now you are responsible for eating choices. Um, but a lot of those choices are limited because you're dealing with kind of shitty cafeterias or whatever. So you eat, or at least my experience, like a lot of chicken strips, burgers, like all this unhealthy stuff, drink a lot more, put on weight. And then so like the rest of the university, it's like four years of kind of figuring out how to do this thing. I was like, oh, okay. I'm going to be fat if I eat curly fries all the time and drink beer five nights a week. Um, And then you, oh, I also need to be exercising regularly. And you kind of stabilize and figure out, oh, I can do this routine and kind of be suitably healthy. Yeah, that's a great point. And then you're a big shock. So for us, like at that life stage, like if we went traveling at like 26, 27, you're way more that you've been spending 10 years of feeding yourself and looking after yourself. Yeah, essentially. Yeah, no, that's actually a great point because it is. I actually remember I was okay in residence because I actually didn't like a lot of the food. (laughs) Um, But I found when I moved into a house with friends, like my mom had always cooked for me. I didn't really know how to cook for myself. I didn't have the money to just eat out all the time. And a lot of time I just go to the grocery store and I'd feel so overwhelmed that I get a bag of my favorite chips and a chocolate bar and call her a night. And that's terrible for you. I mean, even with a 19 year old's metabolism, your body can only deal with that so long before it just starts storing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's weird thinking back on it because I guess like with all knowledge in general, you kind of lose perspective on the fact that you didn't know things at one point. Mm -hmm. But for most people, I think it's almost like money, like money and nutritional education for a lot of parents um, at least for people our age the kind of whatever you call it like millennial i think we're gen y whatever one of those things we're not um, young enough to be millennials right <laughs> what are millennials <laughs> they're born in the 2000s no i don't think so. yeah they are <laughs> I thought they were like people in the 90s anyways we're both born like 89 so <laughs> we're gen y <laughs> okay but for these people our age group it seems like parents aren't spending a lot of time educating their kids about nutrition and eating properly because like parents feed their kids. Kids don't want to make their own food or for whatever reasons, parents aren't, you know, bringing their kids into the process, letting them learn about this thing. So like, I think I'd heard about calories. Like I knew what calories were, obviously I knew they were on the box, but I didn't really have any like strong attachment to them because I would go to Quiznos and eat a meal that probably had probably close to 2000 calories in it for lunch and just be like, sweet, that's good. And then I remember 
<laughs> and just like, so I, at one point weighed 235 pounds and I currently weigh like 165 pounds. <laughs> so I've lost a <laughs> shitload of weight. But like, I remember being like so fat and being like, okay, this obviously isn't cool. Like I can't be this fat and getting like an app where it tracked calories and like kind of learning that system of like, okay, this calorie thing. And then now it progressed to kind of like a post calorie world where I'm like, okay, this calorie thing kind of is effective, but that's not all there is to it. Yeah. I know that's definitely an interesting point. I, yeah, I, you know, in health class and school, you're kind of taught about like, you know, what foods you should eat according to like Canada food guide, which is completely stupid. I think. Oh yeah. It's like, <laughs> it's so bad. <laughs> Just have like an ice cream cone in a small part. It's like, no, probably shouldn't eat that at all, even though it's delicious. Um, but yeah, you get this concept of calories. You start educating yourself on that. And I think for me, it really became, you know, when I was eating quite bad in second year and my body was gaining weight, I was like, okay, this isn't okay. You know, this is kind of like what my mom told me five years ago that I wasn't really listening to because it didn't matter at that time. And then it's, you know, you start actually thinking about what, how many calories are in your food. And I very much became consumed with, you know, calories going in my body. It didn't matter if I was eating them in the form of chips or if I was eating the form of lettuce, it was how many calories are going in, which is a pretty unhealthy way to look at that. It's, it's a misconception, right? Because you can eat a ton of avocado, for example, you don't need to keep track of your calories for avocado. It's a healthy fat. It's a vegetable or maybe fruit. It's got to eat. It's fruit. Um, it's, it's not that that's going to make you gain weight. It's the other things. It's the chips. It's the French fries. It's the cakes and chocolates and cookies. Processed foods. Yeah, the processed foods. So what it is is like processed foods are not as good for you as whole foods. Yeah. But then they've think taken that's... this like rating system of this like calories thing. Um, and then they've at least so big food companies can say, oh, this avocado has 170 calories per, I don't know, serving. And then our bag of Lay's chips has 150 calories per serving. Look at these numbers. This one's lower than that one. Low equals better. And like people kind of cling to that thing. And so there's like different trends about those different numbers on the package. Like, oh, okay, protein's good now. So you want to jack up your protein number or, you know, fat used to be bad. Now fat is like getting more popular so you can jack up your fat number. Even like carbs have gotten such a bad rap for so long. Like there's so many diets, like the Atkins diet is basically no carbs. And there's so many things out there now about high carb diets, like just eating a ton of rice and sweet potatoes and quinoa, fruit. It's pretty interesting. I guess the point that we're trying to make is, you know, nutrition is a really confusing thing. And especially if you're kind of, you know, around our age, like if you're in sort of like the 18 to 30 range, you're probably still just like figuring it out. It is confusing. There's always a new trend. There's stuff all over the internet and around you on TV commercials that's bombarding your mind with all these different things to believe. And it's, it's really hard to figure out what is the right answer, you know? But so I think that there's a lot of complexity that's injected into it that's not really doesn't need to be there right like you go into the grocery store and now there's like thousands of things there but like everything in the middle of the grocery store is made out of corn essentially so there's just a gigantic corn sugar process section and then there's the actual food around the edges yeah so like it's pretty simple like eat actual food occasionally you're gonna eat this other stuff, but like, that's bad for you. But then you can be tricked by the numbers into thinking that maybe this actual food is worse for you than this fake food in the middle. Mm -hmm. I think like being at home, it is really easy to get caught up in all these different like health trends and, um, exercising every day and calories in versus calories out. And because it's so much a part of everyday life in, I think a lot of countries in the world, it does become one of those things that's pretty present on your mind when 
you're choosing to travel, how long to go for and where to go. Yeah. And so like that's, I guess it, it's this learning process of you got to learn a routine that kind of works for you. And that's kind of how humans work, right? You want to find something that works and stick to that. Um, so you're at home and you've stabilized on, okay, I go to the grocery store. I buy like avocado, celery, whatever. And I buy these things. And I then, do buy those things every time I, I go, go to the grocery store. <laughs> I go home and that's what I eat all the time because we like to focus on something and then stop thinking about it. Whereas when you go to start traveling, like now you've got to make all these decisions, all these trade-offs that you never would have made, you know, what's better for me to eat kebab or pizza. And you're like, <laughs> well, like neither of those are really that good, but those are kind of the, the trade-offs you're making. So it becomes a bit more stressful, I guess. Yeah. So I think there's a few things that make staying healthy while traveling or staying fit while traveling difficult. I mean, one of the big things about traveling is enjoying the food in a new place. Like it's undeniable that when you go to France, you want to eat pastries and baguettes and rich cheeses and, you know, good deli meats because that's what France is known for. And you go to Germany and you have to have a giant pretzel and you have to drink beer. And so then it's, I think people get it in their head that it's like, oh, I'm going to gain weight while I'm on my vacation or while I'm traveling. And like, that's that. It's like, well, it doesn't have to be that. And so I think that's kind of where we're getting into with this podcast is that you can actually have the best of both worlds. You can be out, you know, finding yourself, exploring the world, seeing amazing things, trying amazing foods, but you don't have to, you know, come home and buy a new pair of pants. So are you saying that you think uh, people are hesitant to go traveling in the first place because you think, or they think they get fat? Like, is that your personal experience or where does that come from? Um, I mean, like I said before, at the beginning of the podcast, it's never been something that has limited me from going somewhere. I think though, I've definitely seen or heard it with friends as well as my mom. Every time my parents go on vacation, I feel like my mom's like, oh, I'm going to eat so much. Like I'm going to gain 10 pounds this vacation. And every time I think in my head, like, you don't have to do that. Like, you don't have to gain all that weight. I think one of the things is, is people go on vacations or they start traveling. And it's this freedom from being so strict all the time. And they just eat and eat and eat and gorge themselves on all this rich food. And I don't think that it has to be like that. I think that you can make travel part of your everyday life or bring part of your everyday life to travel. Yeah. I guess it's so like a lot of people view, I guess it's like a difference between vacationing and like really long-term traveling. Um, vacationing is kind of like you said, like a break from the rules you have on yourself all the time. Like you're working and you're like forcing yourself to get up in the morning and go to a job. You know, you're forcing yourself to eat food that you don't particularly enjoy and not giving yourself those times where you really like let go of your food rules Mm-hmm. And then you go traveling and it's this complete other extreme where you eat everything, drink everything, do all that stuff. And so if you were thinking about long-term traveling, you're like, well, usually at the end of a vacation, I feel kind of, kind of disgusting because I have been drinking like crazy, eating like six pounds of salt every day <laughs> as I go out for dinner. And then maybe that holds you back from going on a long-term trip because you're worried about that. Yeah, for sure. I think that that's definitely um, something that, you know, people I know have considered. I think for myself, I, because I was like pretty strict, I definitely was concerned about gaining weight. Like it was something that was on my radar. And I think I did take, I did take like some action towards ensuring that I didn't gain weight. And I, I did put on weight in Southeast Asia and, you know, I know why I gained weight. It's because I was eating massive amounts of rice and I wasn't walking. You know, it's so easy and cheap to just take a tuk-tuk or a taxi or a motorcycle anywhere in Asia. Europe, we walked everywhere. And I feel like I had a lot more control over my diet than I did in Asia. And I feel like that's why I gained weight and I didn't gain significant weight, but it was enough that I felt a little bit uncomfortable. And that was something that I kept in mind the entire time we were in South America. Mm -hmm. So let's like get into some of like the best practices or like the things 
that we've maybe changed over the course of traveling. And like next time you, we go traveling, we'll probably continue, continue to doing. Yeah, grow on that. Um, yeah, one of the things that I think is really important is to do some grocery shopping. It's really nice to have like a healthy snack in your backpack, like an apple, an orange, a banana even. Like if you're somewhere third world, it is really good to have those sealed fruits with the skin on them because then you know that they haven't been contaminated by water that's going to make you sick. So those oranges and bananas are good. And you can get you can get fruit in almost any any place at any market. And it's pretty cheap. So I think having fruit in your backpack is really good. So the first time we went traveling or the first place you went was Europe. And we were really eating at um, cooking for ourselves and buying a lot of food from grocery stores mainly or at least from my perspective for the financial reasons because you can't afford to eat out and stay on a reasonable budget but then we went from europe eating at grocery stores which is like a little bit healthier um much healthier and walking around a lot because it's a bit maybe safer more expensive also to get transportation um so it's kind of like a healthier lifestyle but not really healthier because by design it was um, designed that way for fiscal reasons maybe more like by choice is that what you mean by design well it wasn't like health was our priority that's why we were walking and buying food and groceries. yeah totally so I'd, yeah um it was but like i feel like we weren't like, really doing it like i wasn't thinking oh i'm gonna eat this like hummus and rice cakes for lunch today because i'm choosing to be super healthy and i i mean it crossed my mind i was like oh it's better to be eating this but i think it was more for a budget yeah, purpose. Those purposes. Like pepper salami and buns just because it was cheap not really because it was healthy but then we go to southeast asia where it's like wow you can go out and go like nuts at a restaurant for like ten dollars this is awesome <laughs> appetizer beer two, walking, two massive st- plates of food start eating at restaurants a ton um and then yeah the health starts to go downhill so then like this next time we went traveling well let's get into australia a little bit like i think australia was you know, prices are on par with Canada. We're used to Southeast Asia. It's kind of back to being in Europe and we're like, oh, we actually can't afford to eat out as much anymore. And it's like back to more grocery shopping and cooking for ourselves. And it seems to be like a little bit more healthier. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Yeah. But so just like the point I was trying to make, I guess, was that um, cooking for yourself and um, going grocery shopping is a good fiscal decision, but beyond that, it's a good health decision. Like it seems like the food you get in a grocery store is going to be healthier than the food you get at a restaurant. It's also more, I think I feel like the temptation in a restaurant is more to eat something unhealthy because you see pizza on them and you're like, Ooh, I could just do nothing and this pizza will show up versus at a grocery store. Um, it's usually e- easier to make healthier decision and like something basic too like chicken broccoli rice like something pretty like light and basic um i think too it's interesting because so much of our choices in europe and australia were really fiscally determined and then knowing that i'd gained weight in southeast asia because i was just eating out all the time and i was going nuts on food and not walking it was definitely something i kept in mind when we went to south america like i was very like okay let's go to markets and stock up on snacks so that you know, I'm not tempted to eat these unhealthy snacks because I've got snacks in my backpack type thing. And it was like, oh, let's go to grocery stores so we can make a healthy dinner tonight. I think that was more of my thought process with the last trip than it was the first trip. Yeah, I can really identify with that too. And I think I was like more like in tune with what it felt like to be healthy and kind of craved that more than I craved like pizza and French fries. Stuff. But I don't know if it's just like getting older um so old <laughs> but it's like so when i was 21 i didn't really crave the eating healthy feeling as much as i did when i was 25 and is that just because my body sucks and more and it's like at 21 i could just run on anything and now at 25 it's worse or is it just like it takes time to learn what it feels like to be healthy and at 21 i was eating so unhealthy that i didn't even know what it felt like to be healthy I mean, it could go either way. It could be a combination of both as well. I think that definitely resonates with me. And I think for me, it is a combination of both. Like, 
you know, drinking too much alcohol or eating too much sugar definitely affects me more now than it did when I was 21. But I think it's also that I eat so much cleaner now on a more consistent basis than I did when I was 21. Mm -hmm. I think the important thing with the health fitness concepts in general is that it's not, there's like so much information out there and we can offer tips like this is like, Oh, do this, don't do this. But it's, it's all about um, building habits and being like really in tune with what you want. Like if you think that you should go to the grocery store because people have told you that's how you eat healthier, but you don't really like feel that like maybe you don't value health as much as you think you do. You say you value health, but you don't really care that much because you like pizza or something, then you're not going to go do it. Does that make sense? Do you guys understand yeah, what I'm talking about? Yeah, I think I do. I don't know. My advice then is maybe you should start caring about your health or maybe because, thinking about why you don't care about your because health. Because I think for me, like I cared about, I felt like I should be fit and like I wanted to look fit for other people, but I didn't really like care that much. Like I liked not being fit. Like I liked kind of just letting myself go. And I think I was trying to like, force, <laughs> <Really? laughs> I, think, I think I was trying to force myself to do these things. I didn't really like want to do that much and I was forcing it. Okay. So that's where maybe I go traveling and I'm just like, whatever. Yeah. Fuck it. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Definitely does not resonate with me, <laughs> but that's cool. But so I think the, the point I'm getting to is that, um, if you want, like, let's say you're not like me, at 21 and you do care about these things you did care about that though that's what we were talking about at the beginning of the podcast how you were probably like the fittest and healthiest you've ever been when you were 21 and how you did really care about that yeah but i think it was more it was like definitely more um definitely quite a bit aesthetically driven oh, okay like wanting to like look good and then when you were away, you didn't care as much. Didn't care as much. And also, I felt like I was forcing it more. Okay. Instead of wanting to do it, it was like, you've got to do this so you don't look like a fat slob or something like that. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the, the, the point is, or that I'm trying to get to, I guess, is that um, if you want to have... Um, a healthy lifestyle while traveling. You've got to set yourself up in a way that you can succeed to do that and have like the tools available to do that and have like realistic expectations about what you can and cannot do. Like, yeah. So following sure. a super strict diet while traveling, you're probably going to fail. And then if your expectation is no failure, that'll fall apart and turn into no diet. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that that's definitely a really important piece for people to to hear and understand. Um, you do have to give up a lot of control when you're on the road. Then again, you can have some control of your own. Um, something that actually you introduced me to was Tim Ferriss's The 4-Hour Body. Because I was worried going to South America that I was um, going to gain weight. I, I think at that point I was fitter than I was at 21 I trained for a 10 K I was exercising every day, pretty clean diet. I was like, Oh no, I don't want to ruin all this, lose all this progress that I've made on my health when going away. And I think it was, it was you who gave me the four hour body or told me to read it. It's pretty interesting because Tim Ferriss talks about the minimal effective dose that your body actually needs for exercise, which is not as much as people think. How much it's is it? Like, it's not even close to what people think. Um, Isn't it like three minutes? I don't know. Three minutes, like even maybe like seventy-five seconds or something. So people go to the gym. Like, I think people take a lot of action that's out of line with what they're really trying to achieve, and then they kind of just get used to that action as like. What getting, do you mean? I don't get, understand so that at get, all. Uh, people are so for the gym, for example. People want to lose weight or be fit. So they start going to the gym and they think the best method of going to the gym is you go there for an hour 15 and you run around on an elliptical or something. Um, and then they lose touch with their end goal of wanting to be fit and are like, oh, I've got to go to the gym for an hour 15 to feel good about myself or else I'm going to feel bad. I'm going to feel guilty because I'm not doing what it takes to be fit. Um, 
and they get this habitual thing of, I got to go to the gym or else I'm going to feel guilty. When realistically you can get lose weight, get fit and get healthy, get all the benefit you get from running on an elliptical in like three minutes of exercise. If you're doing it. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting. Um, Tim Ferriss's four hour body definitely resonated with me because I was pretty big into going to the gym, staying there for at least an hour, like a 45 minute workout to me was lazy. And so when I'm reading, Oh, you can do, I think it was 90 seconds of straight squats and 90 seconds of arm, like wall push ups. you're going to stay fit. Uh, I don't think he talks about losing weight if you're not maintaining a diet. So for me, I was like, okay, I'll take this like 90 second exercise to South America with me. And I would actually do it in the showers. Confession mm-hmm. did then the showers and hostels. And you know, I didn't lose weight doing it because I was eating how I had to eat to stay full and feed my body in South America, which is not always the best food. It's almost never the best food because it's really difficult to eat raw vegetables and keep them in your body. Um, i.e. not have diarrhea or throw up. And so you are eating a lot of foods that are maybe fried or rice. And I would just, you know, another tip that we're going to share that I'm going to share right now is that we suggest like walking as much as possible. Don't take cabs if you don't have to walk if it's safe, just get as much like walking movement with your body as you can. And I found that between walking and doing 90 seconds of body weight exercises, I didn't gain any weight. But I think walking is just something that's going to happen while you're traveling. Yeah. I mean, depending where you're going, I think that we really took advantage of cheap taxis in Southeast Asia. And I think that that's one of the things is like, it's really, that's where calories in calories out does really like play in. Like you can't eat 3000 calories and burn 1200 and not gain weight. At some point you are going to gain weight. Mm, but I don't necessarily believe that. I think I think that depends, my body that, was proof of that in Southeast Asia. I think it depends on what you're eating. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I don't definitely really believe in the concept of burning a certain amount of calories and eating a certain amount of calories, and that you're going to gain weight. Because I think if you like, I think it's been fairly well shown that like if you eat a couple hundred calories of like processed corn products, um, so let's just use Southeast Asia as an example where white rice is served in really big quantities on almost every meal. And I think there's a lot of oil in like the curries and other foods as well. Yeah. So what would you suggest for people going to Southeast Asia when it's like these really big white rice, heavy carb meals well, so and I maybe think- not exercising heavily? Like it's pretty hot there. It is hard to go for a run. So that's, I guess that's to go back to the minimum effective dose thing. I think, um, if your habit at home is going to the gym for a long time and then you're going to go traveling and try to like find gyms to go to, like that's not going to happen because you're going to get knocked to that routine. Um, so just like the mechanism of people having a routine and failing at that routine is if you can't, if you're kind of forcing yourself to do something and then you don't do it, you're going to feel guilty. You're going to stop thinking about it because that guilt is attached to that thing Mm -hmm. and then it's going to go to nothing. So what do you recommend? So building a routine that you can do, it's very like, um, easy to do no matter where you are. You just need a flat space of four. So the idea from the four hour body of like doing 90 seconds of squats, 90 seconds of wall pushes in the shower and making that your habit. And you know, you can do that any, no matter where you are, you can do that because it Mm -hmm. takes no time. Um, or even like adding to that, if you want to go like a bit more extreme, maybe do some push ups on top of that. So it takes hardly any time. Um, you get and gets your body burning, whatever, yeah. however that mechanism works. Um, and you can get the benefits of doing that. And then you, I think, from my experience, if you are doing a bit of that exercise, you can eat a lot more than you would otherwise and not gain weight. Okay, you can. Let's- Let's go back to like my, but were you, my metabolism. But were you really being strict with staying up with that amount of exercise? Oh, I didn't do any of that. I didn't even know that the four hour body was a thing when we were in Southeast Asia. And like I said, I didn't put on weight in South America. I was more conscious though in South America that, you know, I can't eat six cups of white rice in a day and do no activity and maintain my weight. So I think one thing that 
you know, if I was to travel Asia again, is I would try to, as opposed to eating like three massive white rice meals in a day, I think I'd try to, you know, not eat that much. And it really is hard when it's on your plate and it tastes so good. So whoever I was traveling with, probably you, I'd probably suggest for us to eat at different restaurants, trying more variety of food and sharing stuff so that I was eating less at a time. And I wasn't just like shoving all this food in my stomach and feeling so disgusting and then going to lie on the beach. And then of course I would do the minimum effective dose as well. Yeah. I think using a bit of exercise, and but I think when you're trying to eat, like it's hard to eat healthy while you're traveling because you're always kind of like making a compromise. Like I know a couple of times we've been out like searching for like a healthy meal and you don't really even know what that means when you're thinking about it. You're just like, Oh no, when I see it and it like never, shows, <laughs> never up. shows up. And then you're like, Oh, you end up eating something like really unhealthy. Cause you're like, whatever, fuck it. Well, it's like you just get so hungry by that point. Mm-hmm. And I think that's another thing too, for me is why, having snacks is really important for me because I eat so much more food when I'm really hungry. Like me grocery shopping when I'm starving is dangerous. I'll always buy something that I don't really need or maybe even want, but I feel like I want in the moment because I'm so hungry. And I, I know that there's been a lot of times, especially after like long travel periods, like actually traveling on a bus or a train or a plane, it's like getting off, getting to your hostel, getting checked in and then finding food. I'm just so, so hungry. It's like I'm ready to eat a whole cow. And I don't even like cow. <laughs> yeah. But it's like if I have a banana or an orange or an apple or, you know, some nuts or fruit or seeds or anything in my bag that can kind of like curb that hunger for even an hour, I'll make better food decisions. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, we, we both really found that a lot of like, arguments pop up when we're really hungry and then just make bad decisions when we're really hungry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That has happened a time or two, but it is hard. Like a lot of places it's hard to get snacks that you feel good about even as well. Um, I mean, some places I think that there's always markets with fruit. Like I think a banana is a pretty safe bet in almost every place I've ever traveled to. You can find bananas and they're, they're cheap for the most part. Um, it's, it's interesting though, because, you know, the temptations of food are, it's difficult. You go to a restaurant, you say, you know, I'm only going to eat half my meal tonight or oh, I'm going to order a salad. And then you see the menu and you're hungry and you're tempted by all these other great things. Especially when they're extremely inexpensive. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that, that was me in Asia. I think almost every night I was like, oh, I'm going to say no to spring rolls tonight. And then we get there and it'd be like, oh, that's like a dollar Canadian. Yeah, let's get some spring rolls. Like, screw it. I'll eat spring rolls. I think it's just keeping in mind that, you know, I should have been doing like some squats or some push ups or walking a little bit more or, you know, controlling that food. I think food is one of the best things about traveling, like having authentic food in a country is amazing. And I don't, I don't really think there's much of a point of going somewhere if you're going to restrict yourself severely and, you know, only cook at a hostel and never experience the food. But I think that it also doesn't have to be an all or nothing thing. You can find a balance. And that's, I think the thing we've been circling around, um, Mm -hmm. the way a lot of people view food is that there's like this level of perfection. And when they don't follow that, it comes with a lot of guilt. And then, that's followed by the other extreme of just letting it all go. Um, and it, like when you're traveling, you're not going to be able to follow a perfect diet. Even at home, it's hard. But traveling, like virtually impossible to follow a perfect diet. And then we found, like I found personally, like that it breaks down and you end up having eating like really unhealthy um, because you're unable to follow this perfect diet. So I think getting in tune with the idea that like good enough diet is good. I think, yeah, my belief has been for a long time now is everything in moderation. If I tell myself you're not allowed to eat any chocolate for the month of January, I'm probably going to crave chocolate every day and feel really unhappy because I'm restricting myself. But, you know, I'm pretty content to eat 85% dark chocolate without any guilt. And I don't even eat that every day because I don't need it. 
It can be in the house and that's fine. I'll eat it when I want to eat it. Um, I worked with a lady a few years ago who was very much all or nothing. She was very, very strict. And, you know, if she broke her diet the start of the day, it was just like, oh, well, might as well just, you know, have a major cheat day. And it would be so extreme. Like she'd have two pops, like sugary coffee. I'm like, dude, you ate a muffin. Like, it's like what? 200 calories. You know, it's not the worst thing you've probably ever done to your body. You can make up for that. Like your body's fine. It can deal with those sorts of things, you know, just eat healthy for the rest of the day. And that's a big thing that I've tried to incorporate into my life at home, but also my life traveling is that, you know, I don't need to say yes to plantain chips in South America every single day, but I'm also not going to never allow myself to have them. Because we've done that, like going to the grocery store, think about doing healthy things. And then we get tempted by something we're like, oh, whatever, get that. And then like, we've got that. So we're like, oh, well, might as well just like let loose now. Might as well get a chocolate bar too. Might as well do all this other stuff. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think too, like I remember being in Italy and it's like, I'd go for two scoops of gelato. And I know one time they're like, oh, I just go for three. And you're like, yeah, I might as well just get three. I'm already eating two. <laughs> it's like gelato the size of your head. It's like, well, you probably didn't need three flavors. But I think it's just... I feel like honestly, like you just can't stress too much about it. You have to live your life and be happy with the decisions that you make. And if you're unhappy with something, then figure out how to change it. And there's like a definite, um, like line of thought that happens, right? Yeah. Like you come to this point, um, where you feel like things have to be all or nothing. But what happens is you eat something that isn't in line with what you expect yourself to eat. And then you feel bad about it you feel guilty about it that guilt um like makes you feel worse about yourself lowers your self-esteem lower self-esteem means you're gonna make um have like less willpower essentially make choices that line up with that lower version of yourself lower vision of who you think you are something you eat worse feel more guilty lower your self-esteem eat worse feel more guilty lower self-esteem ding 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 ding. you don't even have a diet anymore because that's what happened so like it's, you, you can identify that series of thoughts that's happening in your mind. Um, and kind of, once you identify that what's going on, oh, I feel bad because I'm feeling bad because I felt bad. And you're like, oh, it's kind of patently ridiculous. It takes some of the pressure off you. But also realizing that getting your expectations in line with what's realistic mm-hmm. to stop that initial guilt from happening. Yeah, for sure. Um, So I feel like that's been a little bit all over the place. So I'm just going to quickly try and just summarize kind of what we just captured in the last like 15 or so minutes. So our tips for our listeners are, um, you know, spend time at grocery stores, get into the routine of grocery shopping for some of your meals. It'll really help your budget as well. Uh, Where you can share plates, eat more frequently as opposed to bigger meals. Try and walk more often. Um, Even if taxis are cheap, if it's safe, it's definitely beneficial to walk, try and walk as much as you can, because it seems like, you know, it's just walking, you know, that's such a, I feel like it's a concept in, in, in my head. And I think a lot of other people's perhaps yours as well. It's like, Oh, it's just walking. It's not doing anything. You know, it is a form of exercise. It is burning more calories than just sitting there. Um, you know, create some sort of routine that's, can be done in a hostel, in the shower, lots of people, you might feel weird about this, but lots of people do pushups in hostels. I've woken up to a guy who was on the bunk above me and he was just giving her pushups and sit-ups right beside my bed in the morning. And I was like, whoa, that's cool. That's dedication. Um, If you're uncomfortable with that and you're someplace that's warm, find a green space, you know, take your, your iPod out there and do some but walking even, lunges so, and push-ups. You don't have to do it for long. That's the thing. The thing with building habit, if your habit is like, I think they talk about like a 20 second rule. If it's more than 20 seconds away, you're not going to do it. So if you are dependent on finding like a park to exercise in, that's probably going to break down because you're going to end up in like central Bangkok and you're like, well, shit, nowhere to exercise. Yeah. Maybe that's a good point. I guess like scope out the city, maybe do your, your 90 seconds on the hostel, scope it out. If you find a park, do another 90 seconds. Um, and just remember that it doesn't have to be all or nothing. You 
just because you eat a croissant for breakfast doesn't mean you need to eat three croissants for lunch and then seven for dinner. You can have a balance. It's okay to treat yourself and then still eat healthy. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing. It doesn't have to be all grocery shopping, all healthy all the time, but it doesn't have to be all junk, all unhealthy. And I think to get into the, the all or health, all or nothing part um, and really like understand how that's operating within yourself, you need to kind of think about what you really want out of your trip. Because a lot of people hold like conflicting values at the exact same time. Mm-hmm. Like I know this from my personal experience. Like I want wanted to be healthy the last time we went traveling while also trying the local foods and having like, you know, a kind of like YOLO experience at the same time. You know, it's like you can't expect yourself to experience local culture and food and at the exact same time expect yourself to eat like a pristine healthy diet because you're going to eat foods that don't like you're going to get to a point where if you eat healthy and don't eat at this restaurant, you're going to be like, well, I feel bad for not experiencing the culture. Or if you make the other decision, you're going to be like, well, I feel bad for not living up to my diet standards. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. I think that's a good way to summarize the all or nothing. Just really like find a balance. Um, food guilt. Don't live with it. That's not nice. Just remember your body is, your body is really capable of, dealing with the things that you put in it, you know, send it some love once in a while in terms of fruit and vegetables and it'll love you back. It'll process that chocolate filled croissant for you. But like, it's like a lot of people say like, Oh, don't feel guilty about what you eat. And like we said it here, like, don't <laughs> try not to feel guilty, but like you're not in control of what you feel guilty over. Yeah, true. That's a good point. But you, so if you, cause you can say, feeling guilt about eating is bad i'm not going to feel guilty about eating then you eat something bad that you're like i'm not trying i'm not going to feel guilty about it you feel guilty then you feel guilty about feeling guilty so what's your solution to that how do you not feel guilty well it's not you like get in tune with your expectations that's going to lower that sense of guilt Mm -hmm. and if you are feeling guilty like you've got to sit with that and think about it like if you say you know i'm just gonna go out and have a good time tonight I'm not caring about what I'm eating. Then you go out and eat and you feel guilty afterwards. You're like, well, okay, I feel guilty. That's a thing that's definitely happening. Yeah. Why do I feel guilty? It's like, well, I said I was going to do this, but I really obviously still care about taking care of my body. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. That's a great point. Yeah. And um, I think I definitely recommend the four hour body for anyone who's going traveling because um, it gives you a lot of tools that you can apply easily while traveling to get, um, a lot of the same results that you're getting at home with your long workouts. And- yeah, for sure. Uh, we'll put a link to that in the show notes. So visit www.theworldwanders.com. Uh, shoot us an email if you have any comments or questions at theworldwanderspodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Doritashimashite. Do you want to translate for our non-Japanese folks? No, it's your welcome. <laughs> Bye.